much time at the library checking out books, not enough uh, returning them. He wants to talk about the forum topic lock on date, lock on date, um, an overdue feature, he says. Uh, so, um, John, I'm going to let you grab the screen and take it away if you can do that. Fantastic. Can you guys all hear me right now? We Just see you and hear you, and you have a lovely background. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It's uh, uh, out here in Pepperdine, so uh, one of our one of our lovely uh, campus pictures here. So I'll go ahead and let me go ahead and get started here. Yeah, microphone. Good job, Daniel. You come around. Alrighty. Okay, so I will uh, go pretty fast here, I think. Um, thank you again for the opportunity today uh, as I talk on the form topic lock on date uh, feature, uh, which I like to call an overdue feature. Um, and let me go ahead and just uh, get started here. Um, and again, my name is John Buckingham. For those of you who don't know, uh, know me, I, I work uh, for Pepperdine University and we've been on Sakai for many, many years now. Um, so, what am I talking about here? Uh, basically, right now, inside of the forms tool, there is something called the form topic availability. And this is the current state that you see here. Uh, there is the ability to uh, lock a topic, uh, that is, to disable topic postings kind of ad hoc. Um, that can be done, you know, after a, uh, a form topic um, has been posted for a while and students have, have uh, posted to it and replied to it. And then there's also this availability area within the topic. Um, and you'll see here there's a couple options where it says you can show immediately um, or you can specify the, the dates to open, uh, show, and or close hide. And you'll see here it says open date and close date. And this is where uh, instructors can specify those open and close dates. Um, however, uh, there are some current challenges to this, uh, to this structure. Um, first of all, the word close, and I'll, I'll kind of toggle back here to the screen we were just looking at, the word close is a, is a bit more conspicuous uh, than the word hide. And so let me just kind of navigate back here to that. Uh, you'll see here, it does say the word uh, close in two locations. It says close right up here, and then it says in parentheses hide, and then right down here, right where that date gets specified, it says, close date. And so uh, one of the challenges that that, that, that creates here is uh, I, I believe that when instructors are kind of filling out this field, they don't really quite know that close actually means hide. And in this case, um, when uh, instructors fill that out, uh, they, they may not realize that at that moment um, when they specify that hide date, that's actually the date when all of that topic will hide from the student. Um, and it can create some confusion for students, as you might imagine, uh, when uh, the topics that they have been posting to have just suddenly vanished uh, from their view. Um, and even recently, we, we encountered a, a scenario where uh, a student who had been posting in multiple topics in multiple classes, um, in one such class, the uh, the topics actually went on hide, uh, given the configuration, and he had no way of corroborating uh, which topics he had actually posted to. He couldn't remember uh, because he'd been posting in so many, and so there was no way that the student could uh, hold himself accountable and, and recall when he had actually posted the, to those topics. Um, there's also another challenge here, of course, and that is um, for those uh, for those cases where uh, instructors really do want to keep the uh, the topic uh, still showing so that students can can still read and benefit uh, but but it, but at the same time set a due date so that students can no longer post to these topics they do have the um, the the lock topic uh, option but it's but this is a, an ad hoc change. Uh, the instructor must remember after the end of every topic to go in, lock the topic um, on that specific date. So it's, it's, a, it's a manual process. Um, and so, you know, basically what we're, what we're thinking of here is uh, a solution that you can see right here. Um, and you'll see here on this specific uh, screenshot, uh, there is a proposed solution to this. Um, so you'll see right at the bottom of the availability area, um, we have, uh, again, kind of a very, very similar setup. We have an open date, we've got the close date, um, and then you'll see up here in the, the text actually specifies what that close means. It means lock or hide. But then right below that, this close action, 
you'll see actually really does specify what close means in this case. And so we don't, you know, we don't want to take away any existing functionality. We really merely want to enhance it. And so you'll see here that once a close date is specified, um, it will prompt the user, at least in our vision, uh, what that close action means. Um, and so it will default uh, here in this example, we decided to default it to lock topic because we, we've we actually envisioned that this is probably what uh, a lot of instructors uh, probably really want to do so that students can, again, kind of can continue to learn and read from their peers, even though they may not be able to continue to post it because that 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 due date has already arrived. And then you'll see right below that there is the option for instructors to opt into hiding the topic if that is indeed uh, what they still want to do. Now, this is um, a, uh, a, a, a screenshot of the, the forum posting. And so there is, of course, a, a topic uh, settings correlate to this uh, screenshot here. And so again, we don't, we, we don't envision taking away any functionality. Um, I would still suggest that we would want to keep that lock, that ad hoc lock topic functionality, uh, which again, only uh, is an option on, on the topic level. Uh, but again, I hope, I hope that this proposed solution is, is relatively clear and we, we hope that it is. Uh, and it's something that we, we, we feel is long overdue. And so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move over here to the last slide and I know this has been quick, uh, but I, you know, we, this, is, this is something that's very, very near and dear to our hearts here at Pepperdine. And so wanted to uh, kind of shine the light on this, so to speak. Um, and it turns out that there is a Jira uh, for this already. And in fact, it's been a Jira that's been there for a little while. Uh, and so um, you'll see here it's uh, SAK25018. So please check out uh, that JIRA when you have a chance and add your comments and add to the discussion. Um, vote for this enhancement. We feel that this is, uh, this is an enhancement that um, all institutions will benefit from. Um, let's, you know, let's definitely, let's keep the, the ball rolling on this feature. We really would love to see it uh, come out um, uh, in, a, uh, in a future update. And uh, just a very, very special thanks to Alan Regan, uh, who originally designed this JIRA and, and who I worked with. Um, so that's really it. Uh, I, I, I might have gone faster than five minutes, but uh, I hope that uh, this was a, uh, a beneficial talk for uh, the community. I, based on what I'm seeing in the chat, John, um, you've got like everybody, you know, would be piling on if they could right now. So, wonderful. Uh, is, wonderful. Yeah. It's, Delighted to hear it. You're getting lots and lots of thumbs up plus one, you know, so forth and so on. So excellent. Uh, oh. Well, uh, yeah, again, thank you. Thank you to all. And again, please check out that, uh, that JIRA. I will post uh, the link to that JIRA here in the chat here shortly. Um, and uh, again, thanks for, thanks for your, um, your consideration. Oh, here's a quick question from D Shore. Uh, is this topic level or forum level? Uh, we would think that it would be uh, probably both, uh, forum level and topic level. Oh. Um, and uh, so that, you know, any topics that, you know, would, yeah. would inherit Alan is saying those. both, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, good. All right. And, well, and thank you're getting, you again. You know, both is good from Christina and so forth. Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. All right. Time. Thank you. If I had a big hook, whoosh, you're out. <laughs> Um, all right, folks, to keep things moving here, uh, next up, we have the man who is vying for the title of the man who needs no introduction. Uh, that title is currently held by Dr. Chuck Severance, but I think that Josh is about to rip that big gold belt buckle off of him and grab it for himself. Um, so Josh Wilson, take it away. <laughs> oh, man, I don't think, you know, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, probably uh, 75,000 reasons why I'm not taking that title away from Chuck, but uh, um, Nope. Good time for my stuff to freeze. Turning off my video here. All right. Um, can I can can I confirm that folks can hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Okay. And we're seeing right. your screen I, now. All right. I had to had some video freezing. I'm gonna I'm gonna try that one more time. All right. So I have five minutes to share with you the data pitch that Wilma and I make to prospective Sakai clients. I figured this might be a fun story to tell. Uh, it might be useful for you guys to tell at your institutions. A lot of times I talk in greater length about data at, uh, at Open Aperio, and I figured, you know, how could an Open Aperio go by without Josh talking about data? So here we go. So I, we've got two different kinds of data that we tend to talk about, and you guys have heard me talk about this. So one is uh, market research data, which we get from through a partnership with a Canadian firm called Infotech. 
they run a site called softwarereviews.com uh, in which uh, they gather data based upon uh, submissions from expert reviewers of products. So uh, lots of people who are expert in Sakai review Sakai and people who are expert in Moodle review Moodle and et cetera for Canvas and Brightspace and others. So um, one, of, one of the things we have here is a true apples to apples comparison. So the, the, the question that, that this market data poses is how do, uh, how do expert users of our product uh, view our product as compared to how expert users of other products view their product. So uh, how do Sakai experts view Sakai compared to how do, how do Canvas experts view Canvas? And one of the things that this data set shows is that uh, Sakai is a market leader because our experts feel much more strongly and positively about Sakai than Canvas's experts do about Canvas and Moodle's experts do about Moodle. Matter of fact, uh, in 2020, we won uh, a, a champion ribbon we were we were the best uh for user experience and in 2019 and uh we'll find out in 2020 because this next round of awards gets released in november uh we won a market leadership position a gold medalist uh ribbon for uh both the strength of the product itself and the strength of the vendors behind it so let me share a little bit of uh the detail behind that gold medal ribbon. So what you see here are the different kinds of categories uh, in which reviewers of Sakai consider its features. So apologies that this is a little bit small. So there's overall feature satisfaction, there's analytics, assessments, content creation, grade book, and there are others. You, you can read those across the top. Um, What's, what's important to note is that the boxes in green are the areas where Sakai shows leadership. So um, we've got a bunch of those boxes in green across the top. There are a bunch of areas where our experts consider Sakai to be better than the experts in other LMSs consider their chosen LMS. So this is, this is a really nice story to be able to tell. And the truth is even where uh, we don't have really strong leadership, we're at the top of the pack and you know, right, right there with others. So if you look at this, Canvas doesn't have better features than Sakai according to this market analysis. Uh, you know, either we're leading or it's about the same between the two of them. And even in areas where like analytics, where we don't have market leadership, there's not a huge difference between our 70 rating and Brightspace's 74 rating. So maybe a little bit, right? But possibly not, uh, you know, possibly not what would turn the dime. So a lot of times what I, what I say to folks is that they really need to make their experience, their requirements central because the grass is not greener and that's what this data tends to show. Let me show a few other data points. Now we're turning to some survey data. Many of you have heard me talk about the MISO survey. So here are two small analyses using MISO survey data. And it's important to note this survey has been around since 2005. 180 some odd institutions have participated, including uh, such slackers as Harvard and Yale. So uh, the, this first piece of uh, analysis that I wanna show is a look at faculty views of the effect of instructional technologies on their ability to achieve their teaching goals. And what we see from this analysis is that institutions that have adopted Sakai have a statistically significant difference in the way that faculty view their ability to achieve their teaching goals. Sakai adopting institutions uh, see faculty being better able to address their teaching goals than faculty at institutions that have adopted other LMSs. So these are small differences, but they are meaningful and statistically significant, and it's an area in which we stand out. Let me move on to one other data point. Uh, this goes back to the grass is greener argument. So this is a look at LMS satisfaction, uh, comparing platform against platform against platform. <clears throat> um, oh, one thing I should note about the, uh, the instructional technologies analysis, take a look at the N on the right side here. The N is 10,800 faculty responses. This is, this is a big, big data set, and so this is something you can lean on. Likewise, the N for this satisfaction analysis, for faculty, it's 24,000. For undergraduates, it's 58,000. These are large ends, so this is, a, this is a robust finding. So what do we find here? We find two things. One is that undergraduates are generally more satisfied with the LMS than faculty, but as we look across the red bars, yes, there are minor statistically significant differences 
uh, between platforms, but they're so small as to be uh, fairly meaningless. They are, you know, they're, they're not practically significant. So they are, it's, uh, you know, a 0.01 or a 0.02 difference uh, in, a, in a scale of four, and it's not really something that you can act on. Likewise, for faculty, as we look across the board, um, there are there are statistically significant differences here, but again, they are small enough, 0 0.05, 0 0.08, and a four-point scale to be uh, significant statistically, but not actionable. So the big takeaway here is that the LMS is a high satisfaction service, no matter what LMS you run. So if you're at an institution and you're using Sakai, think about how Sakai works for you at your institution. Or if you're an institution that is thinking about some other LMS, you know, don't be thinking about what the marketing team tells you. Think about what your needs are and really uh, evaluate these LMSs that are on the table against your needs. So that is the, uh, that's the end of my uh, rapid run through some data. So you just heard the timer go off, which means you're out. All right. Perfect. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you to post the link to the, uh, the data. Fan Lee had asked for it, but Wilma took, beat you to it, took care of that. So if, if you all are interested in this uh, data, it is available on the Sakai website and it, it's powerful stuff. I use it all the time. It's one of the things I lead with when I'm talking to people about uh, joining the LAMP consortium. Okay. Moving right along because we have so much to cover here. Uh, next, we have Matt Miles from the Open Aquella group, which is going to be exciting because I don't know much about Open Aquella. He's going to talk about uh, using Open Aquella to deliver 3D models, which I think is exciting. So, Matt, if you are able to grab the screen and show, share, you're up. Okay. Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, sir. We're good on both counts. All right, so we use Equella to deliver all kinds of content. One of the, one of the things that you can do with Equella is you, it can act kind of like a web server. So for example, we have our anatomy, anatomy and physiology people that create these, have started creating these three-dimensional models in Blender, and then they, they output them uh, into another, another product called Verge 3D to create this kind of an experience where you can click on different things and it changes it. So, so what they can do then is they can take these files that are generated and they can zip them up. Then you can load them into Equella. And when you load them into Equella, it will ask you if you wanna unzip the files. And it will unzip the files and create the whole directory structure. Then, as you can see here, you can select the file that you want to make clickable or to be viewable. For the so let me go ahead and show you how that looks. I've already done that. So it'll show the zip file, and then it will show the file that you've decided to uh, display. And so that becomes a link, and here is the end product. So we have a three-dimensional model here that you can move around and they can share this with the students. And that's why I call Equella kind of the, uh, uh, the Swiss army knife of content management because you can deliver files of any type. You can deliver video or audio. And in this case, you can create an entire little web project and load it into Equella. The reason being is that what Equella does when it makes what's called a contribution is it creates a folder on a web server and it auto generates this name for it. This is the version number and then the, this is just the directory structure below it. And so we have people that create little Node.js projects. They'll create projects in H, HTML5 and JavaScript and load them into Equella. So uh, this is just one example. This is a new product project that they're working on. They've had other models, but they, they didn't have this capability. So this model also is a printable. Uh, we have printed models of the same thing, 3D printed. So we use the same model to generate the 3D uh, project and to print these models for students. So we have them in labs. We also check out these models in the library. 
And we're also looking at uh, taking the, these printed models and sending them out to different uh, sites where cohorts could come and play with them. But in some places, they'll never be able to get the models. So this is the next best thing. Any questions? This is cool. Um, now I'm a little confused. Let me make sure that I'm clear. I mean, it's Aquella is basically serving up this content. That's its main purpose. The That's content right. itself, the, the muscle model was generated externally, correct? That's correct. And so like we use, uh, I use Xerti. You can create a Xerti project and then you could load it into Aquella and deliver it inside of Aquella as well. Yeah, okay, very Which cool. For a lot of our faculty because then they don't have to worry about having their own web server. They can use Aquella as their web server and then they get all of the uh, added value of security and um, right and, and they can share it more easily as well. So lovely. Okay. That's, all got, that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> and you did a fine job <laughs> and and now you get the hook. Um, let's see who's up next. Oh, my goodness. You know who's up next? Me. <laughs> Just a minute. <laughs> Oh me, I, I'm I'm not I'm juggling too many things here. Martin, should I introduce you? You know, this is Martin <laughs> Ramsey. He uh, leads the Lamp Consortium. He's a uh, in a in a contender for that uh, gold belt we talked about, and uh, he's going to talk about the new Lamp webinars. Right, and this will be this will be short. Uh, just to confirm, Josh, you can see my screen and and hear me. You look and sound amazing. Oh, good. I'm so glad. My mom will be happy to know that. Um, okay, so yes, J just right quick, in case you don't know, I think many of you do, most of you do, but just in case you don't know, the, LAMP, the, the LAMP Consortium is this group of educational organizations, currently we're at 21, uh, that share a single instance of Sakai, I keep stressing that because that uh, creates some interesting challenges. Terry Golightly did a really good job in the first session this morning of talking about some of those challenges, but not only Sakai, but Big Blue Button and Karuda and other software and we share the cost among the members, which makes it affordable for smaller organizations. And we, what we're trying to do is, is lower the technical barrier so that um, schools that just don't have a lot of technical resources can, can use the software. And, and frankly, uh, we like each other. We, we just, uh, we enjoy being together. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. What I really wanna focus on is the fact that every second Thursday of the month since, uh, boy, when did we start doing this? I've suddenly realized the pictures are covering since 2006. That's what I thought. Um, we, we have been having a monthly conference call. And in 2013, when Big Blue Button added the capability for recording uh, meetings, we've been recording them. And so you can see on the screen here, we've got a lot of, of old uh, web conferences that we have recorded, but wait, there's more. We are actually going to change um, the format um, starting in July, so starting next month. Our past conferences were focused more on sort of the business of running the consortium, but the new format's going to focus each month on a single topic of interest to educators. So um, we're, we're deliberately trying to appeal to instructors and instructional designers and even administrators. Um, and today I'm basically announcing that we'd like to open these up to the larger Aperio community if you're interested. So that's, the, that's really the point of of my lightning talk here is that these are these are now available. Um, some of the topics that we're planning on covering, competency-based education, I'll talk more about that one in just a second. Uh, how to build accessible courses, Terry Golightly is an expert on that, she'll talk about it. Uh, Terry Ann Smith at New Brunswick is gonna talk about writing quality rubrics. We've already uh, explored which topics we wanna start covering. Um, uh, facilitating the virtual classroom, You know, how do you go about doing that? That's probably a, a good topic for people right now. Uh, storing and reusing course material, what's a, what's a good way to do that, and so much more. Basically, we're just continuing to look for topics that we think will be of interest to uh, particularly schools that are smaller, like, like our schools are, but um, faculty broadly um, and other instructional design folks and so forth. The competency-based education topic, which is going to be our first one, is going to be presented by Eric Green, Jay Selfridge, and David Dowell, um, who are are part of Clear Creek Baptist Bible College, which, are, which is a LAMP consortium member. They have a new master's program that focuses on 10 competencies that the learner has to acquire. Um, and the learner is in charge of pacing. So it could take them six months, it could take them two years, 
um, that before they have mastered these competencies and demonstrated these competencies. And so when you think about how Sakai is designed, um, they're, they're really flipping it on its head. They're going to have one course site per student uh, rather than multiple students enrolled in a single course. It's going to be quite interesting. I'm very interested to find out how they're doing it. They have just received their SACS accreditation. For those of you who are outside the U.S., this means that they have been gotten approval from the, the government for, for this program. Um, and, and so that's going to be uh, something that's going on um, just coming up here in the in next month. I guess it's July 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S. If you'd like to attend, I just encourage you to sign up. I'll put that in the chat in just a second. Um, and you can sign up yourself. You can sign up other people at your institution. We'd love to have you. Um, it's it's going to be just we're we're opening it up and making it widely available. How'd I do on time? I'm done. <laughs> um, let me paste the paste the link here just a second so that you'll have that. Okay, there's the link so that you can sign up. Um, all right. Oh, and I've been missing all kinds of chat that's going on. Oh, and Terry beat me to it. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Um, I am, um, I'm done with my lightning talk. And next up we have, oh dear. Uh, I want to, I don't want to mispronounce the first name. Is it Elna Van Nyker? Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Oh, that's cat case. <laughs> very good. All right. We're going to let you take it away then. Okay, so I'm not actually going to present. This is a video that was created by one of my colleagues and we just wanted to share what we've been doing with lessons at our university. Good day. We are from the Center for Teaching and Learning at the Northwest University in South Africa. This is a demonstration of how we are streamlining lessons development. The developers involved is Suzanne Leibscher, educational technologist, and Zarista Fistar, multimedia developer. Our ideal is that lessons is used in a structured way to guide the learning experience, enhanced with interesting content and interactive activities. The problem we experience with the development of digital module content is that Effendi lessons is a blank slate and lecturer, lecturers start from scratch. They don't always know where and how to start. The result is that there's no consistency in terms of navigational structures or lesson page layouts. Lecturers play designer by creating their own banners and icons. And often the sites are very text heavy and not very interactive. In our pursuit for solution to support lecturers better and ultimately improve the learning experience of students, we were inspired when we came across the CSS customization of Dayton University. So Arista started changing and optimizing the default CSS file that Dayton University made available. The code led to numerous other CSS changes in the past six months. Our solution was a project site with importable templates. The templates includes responsive banners that improve learning on smaller screens. And mostly the templates that can be imported has navigational structures, both in Afrikaans and English. These structures have empty sub pages up to study unit 10 that can be populated with content from the lesson page templates. Both in Afrikaans and English, the lesson page templates includes the, the elements that you will use within a lesson. So we use blended learning at NWU. So you'll see there is like a class preparation section, a during class section and after class section, and then also extra resources and reflection. There's lots of icons, but obviously you just use the ones that you need in that study unit. So this is the template that you duplicate within all the study units. So to keep that consistency, I'll show you some more ex elements. For instance, these are CSS styles for tables. I'm sure you know that in the text editor, tables are not responsive on smaller screens. So these tables are, and it just looks so much neater than the normal table in the text editor. And then Zarissa created different alert boxes that makes text stand out in between sections. And there's panel boxes as well. It's good to use these for signaling for certain types of information. And then we also use the speech bubbles where we insert the pictures of our lecturers themselves to personalize the learning experience. I'll show you some examples of the banners. The elements at the, ba at the back, the photos get replaced with custom designed banner um, graphics for the site and then the text that you see there is a table element so the lecturers has control over the text 
to use to customize on each page and then what you're seeing here is a way to change the color of tools like the question tool and the student pages tool and also the checklist tool the process goes something like this we get a request and then we import the assets to that lecturer's site and then we have a consultation session that's um, step three there and then step four to seven is basically customizing the template deleting elements um, make duplicating the structure that was chosen for study unit one up to ten so step eight is actually we duplicate it on each study unit and then you rename the banners and the pages and then you're ready to populate your content and that's basically in the lecturer's hands then to make the, les the lesson page interactive and applicable to the module content. I'll quickly show you before and after. This was site was created by a lecturer with no help from CTL and you'll see that she basically just used a template and added some color to make it look nice um, and basically this is the result um, and this is the study material that the students have to work with. So when Zarista got involved she um, imported the template, customized it and this is what the after picture looks like. It's got custom CSS and it starts off with a nice banner at the top, custom designed icons that signals important information, an interactive way to present the outcomes with the checklist tool, the color like you can see is customized, more icons that signal specific elements, that's the class preparation section with a, a video there and then a linked PDF and like you can see it links to other tools like the test and quiz tool and there you have a question tool inserted also changed with the custom CSS style and there is the comment tool as well to stimulate conversation. Thank you for watching. Well, that was fast. <laughs> so, um, let's see, there's a lot of questions that are coming in the, in the text here. Elna, do you want to tackle some of these or address some of these? Because there, there's some good questions here. Uh, I tried to answer the questions as they were coming in, but if there's anything I missed, you're welcome to just um, tell me. <laughs> well, broadly, um, and I, I know that it was one of the slides, but um, there were questions about where these, this, can I call it a repository um, yes. of, of, of tools reside? Is it in a centralized site that then gets imported from? Or how do you do that? Yes, so we have learning designers um, within CTL. So a lecturer or a faculty member will contact a learning designer and say, uh, I do want to make use of your templates. And they will choose um, what elements they want. And the learning designer will then import from the repository site to the lecturer's course sites. Okay. So that that um, that answers the question that I had about permissions. Then um, to this this repository site, um, would it? Be, uh, we've got a question that's just come in. Um, would it be possible? How can faculty import this template? So if a faculty person were to say, or or if you were to say, a faculty person would be allowed to do this directly, uh, rather than working with an instructional designer. As many of our schools don't have an instructional designer. Can you think about how you would go about doing that? Yeah, we would probably just make a copy of the site for them. Ah, okay. So you'd, you'd replicate the site and, and then say, yeah. have at it. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, um, so David, they, um, sorry, uh, Martin, I just saw David's question. We do, we made use of CSS to create a lot of the um, elements in the templates. So when we do the import, we import our CSS as well. So it's, it, I think what Dave is really asking um, is it's not just a CSS, but it's the no. CSS in conjunction with the elements that you build using the CSS. And that's what gets replicated and, and the site gets built off of that. Yes. Okay, very good, excellent. Other questions? Yes, we do have, um, <laughs> yes. Um, Jen is asking me and I think she's right. I. I I did such a darn good job that um, I should have let people have a little more time. Uh, we do have a few more minutes. So if anybody else wants uh, a chance to uh, talk about something, we, we've got a little bit of time here. And we have a question already uh, for, for Elna again. Uh, is it possible to share this excellent template? Where can we find this? 
Uh, so it is on our instance of Sakai, um, but I'm sure there's a way that we could possibly share this. Uh, I will put my email in the chat and then you can contact me. Okay, there you go. Excellent. Okay. And Naldo's saying he's from NY, NWU as well. Um, Bootstrap Elements created, uh, also create uh, beautiful layouts and functionalities and lessons. So good. Okay. Does anybody have a topic they would like to tackle um, since we have a few minutes um, in, our, in our lightning talks? Night, okay, there we go. Naldo should do a lightning session. There you go. You're up, Naldo. <laughs> Naldo is actually one of our learning designers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's good. Um, but you want to talk about bootstrap elements briefly? Um, I don't, hi, I don't know if, if, if you can hear me, but my internet is actually very slow. It, it crashed like in three times in the past five minutes. So I don't think it's a good idea. Oh, well, you can talk, we can hear you. Okay, um, so um, what Sarissa did was CSS in um, the lessons. So um, what I did further was just to create or take HTML, element, HTML elements and bootstrap elements to um, create other layouts in lessons to uh, guide their learning experience in Sakai. So that's basically what I did. And you're leaving people wanting to know more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and if, if with a better net, better internet connection, we'd love for you to show that sort of thing. I can try to show you. I'm willing. Okay, let me just quickly log on to um, Sakai here, and then I can try to share my screen, and then you can see what I did in my developers um, site. Okay, so I hope you can see. We're, we're doing well so far. Okay, so this is my developer site. So I created um, like the overview banner, but they can create their own banner by clicking on a DIY document. And then the unit is basically just various elements that um, I did. It, 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 it's a very generic um, layout. So this is a bootstrap element to just guide them through the... Um, themes on the left hand side. So this is also a CSS um, banner that is inserted. Um, this is based on Dayton's, um, well, how, how they start a lesson. So they say hi, and then what you can do, just a bit, a bit of background information, all those things, study content, um, you can go, go to the discussion forum. This is very basic. So um, I created more things as I went along. So this is also a bootstrap element. So if you have your content and you know exactly where and how you should um, do your time management, then you can say in various places in your course, so you are 40% done now. Um, this is also um, bootstrap, so you can create learning content by means of this, and then also click and then stuff appears. Mm -hmm. Again, bootstrap, also these boxes. You can quickly navigate through photos. I don't know how to let it submit because I don't know a lot about that web-based stuff. Um, so again, all these elements are just basic um, variations of the first, so they can just decide what they want to have in, the, in their own lessons. So right you can shower. have a lot of patterns. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Francois is asking, could you show what how it looks like in the editor? Yes, yeah, so in the editor, it looks a bit wonky um, because it, you have to you have to know some source code to properly 
do it. But once you have the source code, well, the source code is actually um, available on, like if you just Google it, you can find some source codes that are easier than other source codes. And then after you have that, you can just tweak it until it looks better um, for you and your lesson. And then the end result is actually sometimes very nice. Because I, um, some of them aren't how they appeared in, let's say, it's, I think it's W3C school, something like that. They have some variations, but then I tweaked it so that it, so that it looks different. And Fanley is asking if the progress bar is automatically generated or is it an image? I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let you tackle that. Well, um, it, it's not automatically generated. You have to type in 40%, 50%, 60%. So um, you have to know in advance, if the student lands on this page, then they should be 70% or so done with the module. Then you can have that progress bar. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, it's, I'm, Francois is making an important point here. Uh, it's really important to let people know what is possible. And if I could just add an anecdote here, we're working with uh, a, a new member of the LAMP consortium that works with um, disadvantaged high school students, giving them a college experience. Well, this year, because of COVID-19, they can't come to campus. And so suddenly, people who are used to working with disadvantaged youth are suddenly finding themselves thrust into a distance ed environment. And so we're working with them, trying to help them out. And it's so tough to just give them a blank slate um, like this, uh, not like this, not what you're showing, but, but um, a, a blank lesson slate and say, you know, you can do anything you want. They need to have some guidance. And so I think this is fantastic. It just gives people a place to start. So, well, that was the basic developer site that I created with HTML and Bootstrap Elements. Um, and as Alna shared in the video, um, we are in CTL, we, we, we want to showcase beautiful content and a nice, well, learning experience for the lecture and the student alike. Absolutely. This is wonderful. You even got a cool from Chuck Severance. So that's, you know, that, that's a badge of honor there. And Laura Geckler has pointed to uh, a URL at Notre Dame where you can copy uh, bootstrap code like this and paste it into the editor in source mode and, it, and it'll work. So that's great. Um, yes. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Does someone else have a lightning talk? One more topic before we let you go. We've got just a few more minutes. This is your chance as a community. There are 55 people online right now who are all just waiting to hear what you have to say. Well, sure, I could. This is Laura Geckler. Of course it is. <clears throat> Go ahead, Laura. I could highlight the site that I just put in. <clears throat> yeah, Would you do like it. that? Yes, sure. do it. Okay, here we go. Uh, so can you see my screen? We're in good shape, Laura. Go for it. Yeah. So. Randy Harrison, an EdTech librarian, has built this site, Bootstrap.io, which you go up here to containers, and I have used, oh, let's say, um, carousels. I like carousels. In fact, this code can be seen in our version of Sakai the minute you log in, because that carousel um, is, is uh, right here, and this time, Ah, you're right. This is an image grid. I often have a carousel here where I take one of those pictures and um, and then there are right and left controls and you can time them so they move automatically. We did discover though that faculty tend to use these better um, in the carousel because they just go here to click on something else. They may not see something that's the second or third slide. So even though this is very cool, you can see the right left controls here. And there's the code. You don't really even have to know code. You just copy this whole thing and paste it into any text editor inside of Sakai. It's a wonderful, amazing thing. So let's see, here's a lessons. And I use, um, this isn't actually from there. It's just a definition for week one that I put in the lessons, the lessons code. But if you were to do something different, um, you can invoke the text editor with that, put in source, go back here, copy all this stuff, 
take it back here, paste it into source, and you've got something you can play around with. And there are placeholders that Randy includes in his codes so that you know when you go back to source where to put the image and how, image, how big the image has to be to uh, sit it here. So here's a placeholder that's 800 by 400. And all I'd have to do is get another URL, probably from something I already uploaded to resources for this site, and paste it in there, and away you go. It's very sweet. OK, a question from Alan. Uh, did Notre Dame have to whitelist or modify anti sami rules to allow for select tags, attributes, et cetera, to avoid the dreaded yellow HTML not supported warning? So no, um, Sakai was, um, let's see, I think it started with version 12. Uh, developer can correct me if I'm wrong, but has started supporting bootstrap. So anytime you find bootstrap code, this code is all, is maintained inside of Sakai. Um, I'm not using anything that Bootstrap doesn't know about, such as carousel indicators. Now, this this would be a problem if I wanted to use that, right? Because it's not HTTPS and it's a different domain, which is why I say I usually upload um, the files that I'm going to use just like you would on a website. I create a site assets folder in resources and I hide it from the students and then I put all the images that I'm going to use or banners or, or whatever in there. And then I just use um, this kind of a link and I take it. You're not sharing your screen anymore, so we're not oh, seeing oh, what you're oh, talking about. Sorry. Uh, it's a lightning talk. I got to talk fast. <laughs> you're doing very well. OK. So then, um, because I put it in Sakai, uh, here's my Sakai URL, uh, that part We're still that... seeing the Zoom t tab, so we must not be seeing the right window. Yeesh. OK. Sorry. That's my job. You look like an idiot, Laura Geckler. Thank you. <laughs> share screen, pick the right desktop, yep, share that. That's the one. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so then, as Alan pointed out, I could get anti sammy kind of things, but I don't because the file is already inside of Sakai resources. I take this part of the um, URL that I get just from clicking on it, right? And then I can go back to which lesson did I have open? I'm not sure where I was when I pasted that in and I didn't save it, but you get my point into the placeholder um, mm -hmm. kind of thing. I just, I just go ahead and paste this. But what a great strategy. I mean, put these last several uh, talks together and, and essentially don't start with a blank sheet of paper, start with something so that your, your, your faculty um, are not faced with a dreaded blank sheet of paper. Um, have right. a repository. Use um, um, all these wonderful objects that you can get. Um, and well, this is fantastic. I would love it if uh, the gentleman speaking before me would um, save some of those to the some of his assets to the discussions, and then we could all use them. If he wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah. There you go. Okay, and uh, Elna says that uh, NWU is also working on some new and more templates for the CK editor. Yay, okay. Um, Alan says, do we have a list of which version of Bootstrap is in each release? I recall the instructional designer trying Bootstrap calls, but it wasn't supported in the 19 version since it was a newer Bootstrap she was trying. Hmm. So this is Chuck. I. So I, I think we're going to be bootstrap three for a while. Bootstrap four is quite a departure. And so uh, the reason bootstrap four, I've not heard anything. Others can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've not heard anything about going to bootstrap four. Bootstrap four is not, is so different than bootstrap. It'd be hard for us to go to bootstrap four, I think. Okay. Fair enough, Chuck. Um, all right, looking at the clock. <laughs> We're having a good time here and, and it's, it's, I'm sorry to cut people off, but we are at the end of our lightning talks. Um, you have been struck by lightning in many ways and I hope that you'll go and do good work and, and continue to stay in touch with each other because that's how this community works. We, uh, we work together all over the world and share and it, good things happen as a result. 
So thanks very much, everybody. We, let's see, our next session starts um, at the half hour. So we've got a 10 minute break and then we go to more breakout sessions. So thanks all. Did you see